Uh, here. Okay. Let me see. okay. All right, everyone. Uh, welcome again to the ANU Indonesia Project Global Seminar. My name is Arianto Patunro. I'm hosting this now with Ruth Niki Julu. We acknowledge the first Australians and pay our respect to elders past, present, and emerging. We are grateful for the support from the Australian National University and the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Today we have uh, Dr. Maria Monica Viharja. Uh, she presented already in this series, and so we are grateful that she comes again presenting uh, her work. So today she is going to uh, talk about the results of the COVID-19 Digital Merchant Survey. That's a survey conducted by the World Bank in Indonesia in December last year. So Monica will be uh, discussing some insights from that survey. And as usual, we will have a question and answer session after the talks, but if you want, you can always write your questions anytime on the Q&A box, uh, not on the chat box, and we will attend to them in the Q&A session. And please also kindly feel a little polling when it appears on your screen, because we need this to improve our series. Um, just a little bit about uh, Monica. She studied in Cambridge and Cornell University. And of course, now she is the, uh, an economist at the World Bank in Jakarta. So uh, over to you, uh, Monica. Uh, thank you, Pa Acho, for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone in Jakarta and Indonesia, and good afternoon uh, to those in Australia. Uh, I don't have any uh, better welcoming remarks than just to thank everyone here for making the time to attend this webinar and uh, listen to, to the findings from uh, our recent uh, World Bank Digital Merchant Survey to look at the impacts of uh, COVID-19 uh, on digital merchants in collaboration with Jopi. Should I share screen, Pak? Pa, yes, Jopi? silakan. Okay. Uh, wait. Yes. Sorry, thought I joined already. Yeah, you you tried already. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Ruth can also run it for you if you want. No, no, don't worry. One minute. Okay. Okay. Let me share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see? Yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So this, uh, as Paj already uh, mentioned, some of you, uh, attended my uh, last webinar last year uh, to uh, present the uh, findings from the Bukalapak survey. And this is uh, this survey is sort of like a continuation from the Bukalapak survey. Uh, we uh, collaborated with a different platform this time. Uh, we collaborated with Bukalapak before and uh, this time we collaborated with Shopee. And the number of respondents is uh, uh, much bigger than, than before. Uh, we conducted this survey uh, between December 21st to December 25th, and we collected a response from more than 15,000 uh, digital merchant survey on Shopee. Uh, the target population of these surveys uh, uh, was merchants with uh, 30 or more transactions uh, since they joined uh, Shopee to match with the previous uh, survey's target population. Uh, from uh, the Bukalapak uh, uh, survey. Uh, more than 50% of the 
uh, digital merchant sampled have a hundred or more transactions. So we focus uh, more or less on the more serious merchants uh, on, on Shopee. And the analysis in this survey uh, uh, is weighted uh, using the ca uh, calibration rate weighting techniques uh, to represent the target population by provincial location, uh, their sales uh, in November 2020 on Shopee to proxy for their uh, online business size and also uh, based uh, on their highest selling product category in November 2020. And I would like to acknowledge and thank Shopee and See Insight, uh, which is the research arm of Shopee for their collaboration in this survey. So a few highlights from the findings from this survey. Uh, E-commerce is a valuable alternative source of income during the pandemic. 25% uh, of merchants surveyed, uh, surveyed joined the pandemic, uh, joined, joined uh, uh, e-commerce, joined Shopee during the pandemic. Uh, so this is uh, equivalent to 50% of those who joined in the last two years. So this is quite a significant number of digital merchants who joined uh, only during the pandemic. And the pandemic has attracted a particular segment of the population into e-commerce, in particular youth, uh, students, those who are not working, and even full-time workers with a higher share of senior high school education graduates and those who use e-commerce as an alternative income compared to the profile of the merchants before the pandemic. And uh, Monica, there were signs... Yeah. Can I ask a question, a clarification? Sure. So before they join... Uh, the digital merchants during the pandemic, what were they? Were they uh, digital merchants with other platforms or they were not a uh, digital merchant? Uh, we don't know. We don't ask that okay. question. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And uh, yeah, there were signs of uh, recovery by November 2020, although uh, there was uh, some decline in both their total sales and their online sales at the height of the pandemic in April. But by November 2020, uh, the total sales already recovered to the pre-pandemic levels and even online sales were uh, higher than the pre-pandemic level. Uh, merchants were more versatile being able to switch their product categories to adjust to the changing consumer demand during the pandemic appeared to weather the pandemic better. Uh, digital merchants appear to be more resilient than general firms in terms of keeping their business going during the pandemic. Close to 80% of businesses of these digital merchants have kept their business open throughout the pandemic compared to 40% of general firm, which is the finding from our other firm level uh, survey during the pandemic uh, in June and October 2020. Uh, and uh, this finding reflects the ability of digital merchants to switch to selling online to keep their business going. And the perception around business sustainability improved in December 2020 compared to May uh, or June when we uh, had the survey with Bukalapak. And uh, when we asked the digital merchants what are the top uh, three uh, support programs uh, that they would like to, to have to mitigate the impacts of the pandemics, Digital skills, knowledge, and training came up to be the top support program digital merchants want to mitigate the impacts of the pandemic. Other two top support programs uh, were sales and marketing training and cheaper and reliable logistics services. Online use is the main information channels where digital merchants learn about government assistance. So uh, half of uh, merchants who received a uh, government assistance program receive it by applying for the government assistance while the rest uh, receive it like automatically from the government or by other uh, means. And three quarters of uh, those who apply for the government assistance program learn about the government assistance from online news. Uh, only a small share of them learn from offline news, TVs and radio. Uh, cash transfers uh, were the most commonly received and remain to be the most popular demanded government assistance. So one in five merchants surveyed received government assistance and 62% of them received cash transfers. Among those who received cash transfers, most receive it in the form of pre-employment card, Kartu Prakerja, and Banpres, BPUM, uh, which is 
the government's uh, assistance to ultra micro and micro enterprises in terms of uh, cash transfers. Going forward, cash transfers remain the most popular demanded government assistance by far for mitigating the pandemic's impacts. And uh, to a large extent, utilization of government assistance is aligned with the expectations of government. Sellers use uh, different types of cash transfers in different ways, but to a large, but to a large, uh, to a large extent, uh, they already they are already aligned with the expectations of the government. For example, bond press, which is uh, cash transfers for ultra micro and micro enterprises, was used uh, by most merchants for business purposes, and food purchase uh, was used by uh, most uh, merchants for consumption. However, this utilization varied by the employment status of the digital merchants. For example, self-employed tended to use uh, cash transfer for business purposes, while homemakers tended to use uh, cash transfer for consumption. Can they overlap? Like, you know, a household who also engage in as much digital merchants, do they have multiple types of cash transfers? Yes, yes. So yeah, they, they can overlap, of course, okay. yeah. So I have uh, these details later on in my slide. So let's look at the detail, uh, the, the findings in more detail. Uh, who are the merchants that we surveyed? Um, the majority are young adults uh, between the age of 25 and tw uh, 34 years old and slightly more dominated by females. 56.1% uh, were female. And this is in contrast with the fact that only 39% uh, of females in uh, out of total employment. And also uh, these digital merchants uh, were much more educated than the general workforce. Uh, only 8% of uh, the digital merchants had uh, lower than upper secondary school, while in the workforce, uh, the numbers is 60%. Let me switch so I can read better. It's great. And uh, half of the uh, digital merchant survey uh, were self-employed while 14% were homemakers, 79% have two or more dependents. And uh, and large majority of, of them were primary earners in the family or breadwinners in the family. And three fourths rely on e-commerce as primary source of income. Uh, from the 1,000 merchants who answered both this survey and the survey conducted uh, by Shopee in 2019, a net of 6.7% of these 1,000 merchants switched to become primary earners and 12% switched to, uh, to use e-commerce as a primary source of income in 2020. So this says that e-commerce uh, increasingly becomes a more important uh, source of income uh, to uh, many households. So let's, let, let's look at their business profile. Uh, the, vast, the vast majority of businesses that were in operation before 2020 uh, pre-pandemics were MSMEs. In fact, 68.2% uh, uh, were micro enterprises with less than 300 million rupiah of their of, of yearly annual sales in 2019. Uh, most of these digital merchants only joined uh, Shopee uh, in the last two years, and a quarter of them, uh, a quarter of uh, total merchants, just joined during the pandemic. Which means that fifty percent of the merchants who joined in the last two years only joined during the pandemic, which is quite a, a big number. And uh, and half of the digital merchants joined. Uh, more than one platform. Merchants who joined e-commerce during the pandemic um, were more likely to be uh, youth, uh, senior high uh, school uh, graduates, and less likely to be college graduates, uh, more likely to be male students uh, not working or, or even full-time, and use e-commerce as an alternative income source relative to the profiles of merchants before the pandemic. 
Now let's look at the uh, effects of COVID-19 and their coping strategies. So merchants adjusted to the pandemics and to the continuously evolving consumer preferences as people you know, started to work from home and so on and so forth by changing, diversifying and switching product categories. So 39.5% uh, uh, of merchants or close to 40% start and or stop selling a product category. So uh, for example, if pre-pandemics they sell toothbrush, uh, after the pandemics they stop selling toothbrush. Or if uh, of pre-pandemics they never sell mask, after the pandemic they sell mask. 17.1% uh, increase the number of products that they sell, uh, maybe for diversification purposes, while 14.6% decrease the number of product categories that they sell, maybe <clears throat> to uh, make uh, uh, their operation more efficient. 12.4% uh, switch to uh, other product categories. So different between uh, changing and switching here is that uh, when we uh, meant by switching here is that uh, merchants stop selling one category, uh, stop selling one product category, uh, but also start selling a new category. And these uh, three charts or three figures uh, are not uh, mutually exclusive. That so they uh, they 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 overlap. And health is the most popular product category to switch into. So the most uh, uh, along with uh, fashion women, clothes, shoes, bags, F&B, care and beauty, including hand sanitizer, wet tissues, and also home care. So on the right-hand side, side graph, for example, uh, merchants have around 10% chance to switch into and start selling health product categories after they stop selling uh, product categories that they used to sell uh, before the pandemic. And this result is consistent with uh, uh, with the uh, with the press release by C Limited on their quarter two 2020 earning, which says that uh, merchants were adjusting to continuously changing consumer demand during the pandemic, especially towards uh, hygiene related and home care products associated with work from home. And we also see that merchants shifted. Uh, more of their sales to online to cope with the strict lockdown. So between uh, February and April 2020, uh, we see that their online shares out of their total sales rose up at the uh, rose up at the height of the pandemic in April from uh, around 72 percent and to 74 percent. And this 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 difference is significant. Now let's look at. Uh, their resilience and sustainability during the pandemic. Uh, overall, uh, we see that digital merchants were more resilient than, than general firms. Close to 80% have kept their business open during the pandemic, while 70% who have closed their businesses managed to resume their business after some time. And this reflects the ability to switch to selling online to keep their business going. But uh, what we also found is that if they close, so if we, if we see the right-hand side graph, if uh, they close their business, they close quite for a, a while. So 31% of those who close their uh, businesses close uh, for about one to three months, while another 28.2% uh, close uh, more than three months, which is quite a long time for micro enterprises to be able to survive without any cash flows. And the perception of how long they can survive if the condition uh, persisted uh, improved in December 2020 compared to May, June uh, 2020 when we had the uh, Bukalapak survey. So uh, by so in, in May, June 2020, only 31% of digital merchants surveyed said that they were able to uh, sustain their business if the condition persisted uh, um, for more than one year. And by December 2020, uh, already 50% of digital merchants said that they were able to sustain their business more than one year if the current condition persisted. 
large businesses and businesses with uh, businesses with improving sales were more likely to sustain their business longer. So if we see on the left hand side graph, uh, we see that larger firms uh, have more optimistic uh, business sustainability perception. With fifty nine percent of large firms say that they were able to sustain their business beyond one year, compared to only forty five. 0.8% for micro uh, businesses. And similarly, on the right-hand side graph, we see that those who uh, perform better between April and November uh, have a more optim optimistic uh, business sustainability perception. Now let's look at their sales performance. So merchants average total sales went down between February and April. You can see it from the right-hand side graph. Uh, uh, the uh, negative change is significant, is significantly different from zero. But by November, uh, their total sales is already back to the pre-pandemic level. There's no significant difference between the average total sales uh, in, in February and uh, in November. And uh, for uh, online sales, uh, also uh, merchants average online sales went down, but only slightly in April and come back stronger in no by November. So you, uh, as we see in the left-hand side graph, uh, uh, the, uh, the level of uh, online sales uh, was higher by November, uh, significantly higher by November compared to February. Weak demand was the biggest challenge for merchants experiencing declining sales, while lack of access to capital was the top constraint for business to expand or to recover. And uh, these top reasons uh, were consistent with, uh, with, with the reasons expressed by digital merchants back in uh, May or June when we did the uh, uh, Bukalapak survey. And merchants who switch product categories uh, to adjust to the consumer demand, to the changing consumer demand, experienced stronger sales performance between February and November, controlling for other sectors. So this highlights the importance for merchants to be able to be versatile uh, to adjust to the continuously changing consumer demand. And how can uh the private sector and the government support these digital merchants so when we when we ask the digital merchants uh top uh, support programs that they would like to uh have uh to mitigate uh, the pandemic's Im impacts uh digital skills trainings sales and marketing and cheaper and reliable logistic services came to be the top three support programs wanted by digital merchants and one in five merchants received uh, government assistance by December 2020. Around two thirds of them received it via cash transfers, regardless of uh, business size. And merchants who received a uh, cash transfer largely received it via pre employment card and bond press BPUM. Uh, again, which is the uh, cash transfer targeted to ultra micro and micro enterprises. By November, merchants across business size received government assistance with almost the same probability. Uh, also, uh, we look at like how digital merchants use the cash transfers that they received from the government. Uh, sellers. Uh, we found that uh, sellers were using different types of cash transfers in different ways, but they're already according to the government expectation. For example, food poachers, 82% of them uh, said that they use food poachers for consumption, and only 37.7% said that they use uh, food poachers for business. Uh, and 84.2% of uh, merchants said that they use uh, the Banpress uh, BPUM for business, uh, and only 34.2% of digital merchants who receive bond press uh, BPUM uh, said that they use it for consumption. But interestingly, uh, if we break it down, 
uh, uh, to uh, different uh, to, to to merchants with different employment status. Uh, merchants with different employment status used uh, utilize cash transfer uh, differently. For example, uh, self-employed merchants tended uh, or more, were more likely to use uh, uh, cash trans cash transfers for business purposes, while homemakers tended to use more of uh, cash transfer for consumption. For example, if we look at the uh, top graph. Uh, seventy-seven point two percent of of uh, self-employed merchants use PKH, which is the cash transfer, uh, conditional cash transfer for families, for business purposes. While only thirty-four point eight percent of homemaker merchants use uh, PKH for business purposes. While uh, if we look at again the the uh, uh, Top graph: eighty-nine point five percent of self-employed merchants use bun press. Sorry, uh, twenty twenty-six point one percent of uh, self-employed merchants use bun press (BPUM) for consumption, while only while while forty-seven point three percent of uh, homemaker merchants use uh, bun press (BPUM) for consumption. So if the government really wants, for example, like ban, ban press uh, BPUM to be used strictly for business purposes, not for consumption, then the leakage is higher uh, if the recipients uh, were home, homemaker merchants. Merchants who received uh, debt restructuring programs were more likely to receive extension to loan maturity and postponement to loan repayments than subsidized interest rate, either for new or existing credits. And half of merchants who received government assistance uh, receive it by applying for it. And before applying, 72% of them learned about government assistance from online news. So this highlights the importance of uh, uh, socializing government assistance through online news. Only 4.4% uh, learn about government assistance through offline news and 13.4% through TV or radio. Cash transfers are still the most popular government assistance to help merchants in the future by far compared to other uh, programs. So 51.4% uh, 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 said that if if digital merchants for us, what is one one government assistance programs that you would like to have would be most useful to mitigate the pandemics? And fifty one point four percent of them said that it's cash transfers. Okay, Pacho, that's uh, that's all from me. Sorry if I go over some of the slides too quickly. Uh, thanks, uh, Monica. As usual, that's really good and, and comprehens com comprehensive. So we have a lot of time for uh, question and answers. I have I don't see any question written in the Q and A, but I'd like to invite our attendants to raise their hands if they want. To. Okay, we have Peter Macaulay and Hal Hill. So we'll start with uh, Peter. Silakan, oh, pa. Difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, uh, Maria Manarik. Uh, I, I, I just have, uh, as I'm listening to all of this here, yeah, I, I have some general questions because mm -hmm. I don't really quite understand the situation. First, could mm. you just tell us from your own experience, from your own pangalaman, from your, what you mm -hmm. can you give us a snapshot? of what is the sort of person what is the scene what 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 are they i mean my are, are these people mainly at home these are young people yeah there's a seem to be more women than men yeah these are young so young women maybe 27 28 30 years old something like mm -hmm. that they are working at home they have some dependents so i mm -hmm. guess they sound like mothers uh, mm -hmm. are they are they working at home and um how does i mean when they do their work on online uh what is their input and what is their output i mean where do they if they are selling you said fnb food and beverages i mean i guess this is maybe uh coca-cola or something like that i'm not sure canned drinks w what are they doing they they presumably do not handle this stuff 
physically themselves. So, and and how do they transfer it to to consumers? Are they are they using Gojek? Are they is is this linked in with uh, people who deliver by motorcycle and so on? This is question number one. Could you just mm -hmm. give us a little picture? Question number two is what I am not very clear on is the importance of this activity, this, uh, the, this activity you are surveying in the whole scope of the Indonesian economy. Do we have any, any metrics, any, any, any measure of the size, the total number of employees or the total number of sales or something? I mean, I don't know if it is in some sense, you know, 2% or 5% or 10% or 20% of the Indonesian economy. I, I, I just sort of have no idea. That's question number two. Question number three is, could you tell us about the size of the transfers? You made a number of references to transfers. I don't think, if I'm mistaken, I, I, I don't think you actually gave us a figure of the size of the transfers, and maybe it varies quite a bit, but could you give us any, any sort of indication of this? Now, and, and point number four, this is just a comment. This is just a comment. You know, some years ago, a number of years ago, I did research on Malapetaka disasters, natural disasters in Indonesia, especially the tsunami. But I've been looking at reports also from POSO and so on. And, you know, one of the things you said, this is the preference, and you have the slide up right now, the preference for cash transfers. Now, of course, this is actually, this is actually dapati mangerti, yeah? We can understand this. This is an obvious thing. I guess we all prefer cash transfers. But one of the, you, you, you have pointed to the importance of cash transfers. And I, Chumas, I am our lapor. I just want to report to you. I want to draw your, or, or just comment that this actually was, was a lesson from working in, in, in disasters as well. You know, when we mm -hmm. respond to disasters, often, one of the best things, Tita Salalu, yeah, it's not always, but one of the best things that we can do is simply hand over cash transfers quickly. And unfortunately, many governments, many relief agencies do not want to do this. They, they prefer to mm -hmm. give it all out in kind. But so your mm -hmm. lesson, your lesson here about the importance of cash transfers actually has implications for some other activities as well. Anyway, that was my commentar. Cukup ya. I, I had those three questions. Terima kasih sebelumnya sangat menarik. Terima kasih ya. Yo. Thanks, Peter. Uh, those are multiple questions. So just let's just answer it now before we move to Hal. So Monica, you can. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. So in terms of the uh, who uh, like the, the the profiles of uh, the merchants, the snapshot. Uh, uh, so I think from the survey, uh, we saw that, you know, it's mostly like female dominated, uh, 14% of them were homemakers. Others were, uh, like large, like more than, uh, 50% were, um, self-employed, uh, and also more than 50% were at the age of, uh, 25, 34, uh, so, uh, I mean, there, there are some other research uh, that capture this, like who were actually uh, these digital merchants uh, in, in the broader picture. For example, uh, Shopee surveys uh, 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 last year. Uh, but from my, uh, my own experience, pa pa Peter, uh, I did visit uh, one uh, digital merchant uh, uh, before. So uh, she was a, basically she was a, a, a wife, a housewife in a family and she was selling plants. I was buying plants uh, and she was located just on the periphery of Jakarta. Uh, so she was selling plants in her backyard at home. And uh, yeah, that's, that's her, her, her main source of uh, income. And uh, it was delivered uh, via Gojek or or uh, or like Grab or like other uh, online on-demand ride-hailing uh, uh, services. So uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of input and output, so I was buying plants and she was like just growing plants in her backyard and was selling it through online. Um, uh, 
but you know for example like fnb it could be you know someone baking cakes all right uh, uh online bakery so that's uh uh that's that's like you know how how i see you know digital merchants operate um import in terms of importance of the activities in the indonesian economy we have a big uh, flagship uh, digital economy and inclusion report coming out uh in july uh in about a month so it will be like comprehensively discussed there uh the contribution of e-commerce but i can quote some numbers uh so um first of all um uh, first of all uh internet penetration uh at work is still very low in indonesia only 27.2 percent of workers in indonesia use the internet at the at 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 work in the past week uh in 2019 so only 27.2 percent of uh, Indonesian workers use the internet at work in the past week. And, and also low e-commerce utilization, uh, less than 10% of Indonesian workers are engaged in e-commerce activity. Um, and again, it's, uh, it's based on Sakana's data in August 2019. Uh, in fact, uh, only 65.8% or less than two thirds of internet internet using household enterprises are engaged in in commerce. Uh, so even though uh, household enterprises were in, were already engaged in internet, only sixty five point eight percent of them uh, were engaged in e commerce. So that's again based on Sakana's uh, uh, August two thousand and nineteen. So uh, overall, uh, Peter, I would have to say that internet penetration at workplace and uh, and uh, e-commerce utilization uh we're still very uh are still very low in indonesia but the pandemic uh, might change uh that number quite significantly and uh i think we discuss it in the upcoming uh report uh but from this uh digital uh merchant survey which with shopee it shows that it shows that uh you know uh a, a large share of uh, the digital merchant survey only joined during the pandemic. So, and also we have other evidence that uh, basically yeah, e-commerce uh, grew in the intensive and also extensive margin. And uh, in terms of the size of transfers, uh, so maybe there are some experts here who can, who have like the exact uh, number of the size of the cash transfers. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have that number, uh, but Peter, unfortunately. But I think for BLT Productive or Ban Press BPUM, if I'm not mistaken, to a total of 2.4 million uh, for each enterprise. Uh, and for pre employment card, if I'm not mistaken, it's like some free training online, but also a cash or like a stipend, a monthly stipend. Uh, in the total of like, in the total or like each month, like what, like six hundred thousand. But again, uh, if if there are experts here who who know these numbers, then yeah, please uh, uh, answer to pa Peter's uh, questions. And good point about the government not wanting to deliver cash transfer, but more in kind. Uh, I think uh, it's not always the case, but there are some cases. I know that uh, there were some, you know some sort of like uh, cash uh, back or like some, you know, corruption involved when, you know, turning cash transfers into in-kind as we see before with the, uh, in the Ministry of Social Affairs, right? Uh, so yeah, maybe that that's all I can answer, yeah. uh, Papita. Thanks, yeah, sorry, uh, it's not like, uh, you know, perfect answers. Oh, no, thanks, Monica. So, um... Let's move to Professor Harhil and Wage, and later on I will also read some questions from the Q and A. So let's listen from Hal first. Hal, uh, th thanks, thanks, Acho, and uh, Salamat pagi, uh, Monica. Apa kabar? I hope you're keeping well. It's it's very nice yeah, to see you. Thank you. Yeah, and, nice to hear and, your voice, by Hal. And by the way, I'm really missing our Jakarta culinary experiences. <laughs> Because uh, yes. every time I come to Jakarta, we go to a nice restaurant, a different new restaurant, and so I'm really missing it. 
And incidentally, <laughs> yes, me too. Uh, I don't know where the restaurants are surveyed, by the way, because you probably know most of the good ones in Jakarta. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so thank you very much, Minarik Sakali, Monica. So, uh, and it's sort of a, in a gloomy world, it's a kind of good news story, yeah, that there has been this fairly rapid adaptation, mm. you know, mm. to, to online. And also mm -hmm. that some of the government programs are working, which is also, you know, a bit hopeful. So um, since, uh, since Pat Peter Macaulay had four points, can I also make four? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> but I'll make, I'll make them quickly. So first of all, I, I'm assuming that that your respondents are mainly urban, mainly middle and sort of middle and maybe upper class uh, mm -hmm. households and people, which maybe is aspiring. It, it's it's not a, inspiring, yeah, not not a criticism, but I suppose it's sort of telling us perhaps in a way that it might have been exacerbating the inequality pre-COVID in the sense mm -hmm. that it was. The, the main game, a lot of it became online during COVID. Mm -hmm. And so the people mm -hmm. who could adapt quickly were those who had internet, as yep. you said, had in access. So mm -hmm. just a sort of general comment that it's good what's happened, but it's perhaps in some ways indirectly might be exacerbating inequality yep. in the rural, urban, middle mm -hmm. class, lower class. Point mm -hmm. one. Uh, point two, um, is the internet, has the internet been holding up okay? I, I take it from your survey that it it has been, and that also is is quite an important achievement given you know this sudden massive demand for internet usage, um, mm. and also the payment system, you know, which is sometimes a bit complicated. I, I take it the payment system within the internet has sort of been working okay, and that's that's also if it's the case, that's a notable achievement. Uh, a third point, I think Peter might have mentioned this as well, is you've got a sales story, then you've got a kind of distribution delivery sort of story. And I'm wondering whether, to what extent the two were kind of integrated since it's one thing is sales and next thing is getting the product to the consumer. And I don't think you mentioned Gojek much. And I'm wondering whether, or maybe you didn't, I missed it, but I'm wondering whether there's a link between what you're talking about and the sort of general, the Gojek phenomenon. And that's also interesting if it's the case. F final point, uh, it would be interesting to know how Indonesia looks comparatively. And presumably the World Bank's doing these kind of surveys all over the place, uh, if not uniformly, at least yeah, in a broad sense, similar. And it would be interesting to know how Indonesia looks comparatively with, you know, with other regional developing countries. So, uh, uh, Saja, Monica, and thanks again. Very interesting and 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 really good work. Terima kasih banyak. Thanks, uh, Hal. Stay, stay, stay well. Okay, so thanks, another man. set of questions. So let's tackle them right now, Monica, before uh, we go to Maswage and Sherry Tao Kong. Ma maaf terlalu banyak, mungkin. No, that's okay, Pak. No, no, it's good. So yes, Pak uh, Hal uh, about the exacerbating inequality of the uh, internet uh, penetration in Asia, it will be discussed again in the our upcoming Digital Economy and Inclusion Flagship Report, launched uh, on July 27. Uh, so wait for that, but I can give some sneak preview. So uh, yes, so internet penetration has a greater uh, return uh, to wages for higher for higher, uh, for more educated workers. So that is concerning because we already have a wage premium or like a yeah, wage premium, even, even without the internet. And then the internet uh, exacerbated that. So that's like one, one thing that we flag in, in, in the report. Um, and uh, and I, I did some little like analysis as well, uh, like looking at what's happening in you know during the pandemics in terms of people using the the internet uh you know whether uh more workers use the internet uh during the pandemic and uh i i mean some of the findings i i couldn't really uh remember exactly the findings but it it it's something like the it's something like um uh yes so those who uh so those who use the internet at the workplace during the pandemic, including like working from home during the pandemic, uh, had like less impact, less adverse impact from the pandemic in terms of reduction in their income. But if you control for the education level, it all goes away, whether or not you use the internet or not, meaning that, uh, you know, like 
uh, education, like the level of education, it's still like an important factor uh, in terms of being able to, uh, you know, uh, being able to survive better during the pandemic. So, uh, yeah. So the tendency is that yes, if 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 uh, if if we just you know if uh, if policies is not targeted and we just let you know internet penetration to to um, you know to, to operate in Indonesia, then yes, it has the risk of exacerbating inequality. Mm-hmm. And uh, in terms of internet holding up, okay, uh, I have to say that uh, well, being you know, uh, have, having worked in both Jakarta and now I'm in Singapore. So in terms of the, the level of the internet, I'm talking about like, you know, these digital merchants who are in urban areas. So uh, yeah, so they, 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 they should have like access to the internet. In terms of the, uh, in terms of the, in, in the uh, internet access, yes, they do have. The, the problems, uh, the, the, the problem is that it's not reliable in the sense that you know, uh, I can I can do you know Zoom meeting uh, in this webinar without having to uh, to think about whether my internet is going to drop in the next second. But because I'm in Singapore right now, uh, but uh, when I'm in Jakarta, I I always have to have at least like three devices. You know, when I hold this uh, a webinar, because one of them might drop either my laptop or my uh, US mobile or my Jakarta mobile. So I have to have like three devices uh, with me. So uh, in terms of reliability of the internet is, is different, but in terms of the access and the, the fast, uh, in terms of the speed of the internet, it's, it's, it's not a problem. Uh, in terms of the payment system, uh, also is going to be discussed in the upcoming uh, Digital Economy and Inclusion Flagship Report, uh, how, uh, yeah, uh, there's still a lot of room of improvement uh, for uh, for for uh, merchants to or like you know uh, workers uh, more generally Indonesian workers more generally to be to be in the uh, payment system um, and that should improve uh, the e-commerce utilizations. Uh, Gojek phenomenon. Uh, uh, we we have a, a, a good. Uh, discussion about gig workers, digital gig workers in the upcoming report as well. Uh, um, most of them, about like 75% of them are in the transportations, um, uh, transportation sector. Uh, there are three main things. Uh, I mean, this is again like a sneak, sneak preview from the, the report. Uh, three three main findings about digital gig workers, including you know, Gojek uh, riders. One of them is that uh, they they tend to use uh, they tend to work uh, longer hours than average uh, uh, workers. Uh, whether it's like average workers or workers in the informal sectors, they work uh, about like on average 49, uh, 49 hours per week compared to like I think uh, thirty something for informal workers and uh, as as as. Uh, you may know uh, the current regulation is 40 hours per week, right? But uh, they, uh, they, they, uh, on average, their earning per hour is higher than the uh, informal worker in Asia. So that that's that's uh, good news. And then also they tend, uh, they uh, they're less likely to change jobs uh, as well. So the the churning is is. Uh, is less than uh, is less than other informal workers. Um, so, like, yeah. So these are like the the some of the phenomenons of the digital gig workers. Uh, I'm happy to uh, elaborate if needed. Um, one thing that I would like to mention here. I mean, maybe going back to exacerbating inequality. Uh, like, like, like to. To many people's surprise, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I, at least to my surprise. Uh, uh, I, I, sorry, I hear sorry, an I echo. Hear I don't know if somebody is not muted. Yeah, this is better. Okay, so uh, one thing that I noticed uh, about digital merchant survey and also digital gig workers. This 
uh, this uh, workers uh, use low skill technology, right? Like, you know, as long as you have a mobiles and an apps, you were able to, you know, sell online and to uh, offer your services. But uh, the findings from this digital uh, merchant survey and also from the our analysis on the gig workers is that they were more much more educated than average workforce in Indonesia. So they have, uh, you know, they, they, they have at least like upper secondary school and even like, you know, they, they were like college graduates compared to the 60% of Indonesian workforce who only have a uh, lower education or, or below. So uh, again, like I think one of the policy that we should be thinking about is how to make, you know, uh, low skill bias technology adoption to be more inclusive of this lower educated uh, Indonesian uh, workers. And compared to other regions or country, uh, I don't have it in top of my mind, but there's like a lot of like uh, reports and literature, including the Google, Tamasek and Bain companies about uh, e-commerce in Indonesia. But I think the prospect is really huge uh, uh, in, in the regions. Like Indonesia, I think has the most uh, unicorns and decacorns in the in 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 the east asia or southeast asia right we have uh, we have gojek we have tokopedia um and also uh bukalapak uh, and uh and also because of uh, uh because of uh, our population so for example like shopee indonesia is the is the main is the biggest market for shopee so maybe that's all from me, uh, Pat Hill. Thank oh, so you. Thanks Morning. very much, Monica Manarik. And if I may quickly say, if I heard yep. correctly in the queue, the next in the queue is Wage in Singapore, then Sherry in Beijing. So yeah. hi, hello to you both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is like thanks a reunion. Reunion. <laughs> thanks, uh, <laughs> a reunion. Yay, and, yes. and it seems like we have to book you again for those uh, upcoming reports, uh, Monica. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes. Okay, but yes, now let yeah. me invite uh, Maswage from Singapore. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mas Acho, and hello, uh, <laughs> Monica and Pak Hal, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you virtually. And yeah, Monica, uh, congratulations on the completion of this survey, and uh, I really enjoy your presentation. Uh, Congratulations. And yeah, I have two questions. I think in your presentation, you mentioned about the uh, support that these merchants needed. Uh, one of them is about the digital skill and knowledge training. So perhaps you can elaborate more about this uh, because it's uh, kind of a, a broad uh, term that uh, nobody quite really understand what is exactly digital digital skill, digital knowledge that are uh, yeah. relevant for e-commerce uh, uh, business. And uh, of course, uh, if we uh, link to the problem within the merchants or the current uh, players in e-commerce, whether they have difficulty in getting the workforce that uh, have this specific skill or they want to do it, uh, they want to learn this skill uh, by themselves. So yeah, that's about the skill. And my Sorry, uh, Wagi, I, I, I could not really understand your second question. So No, I saying... haven't asked the second question. Uh, oh, okay. The first question oh, okay, so is that's, about that's, digital that's, skill. That's, okay, that's the first question still. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the second one is, uh, I think it's about the uh, ecosystem of the e-commerce in Indonesia. Uh, I'm not sure whether the survey also asks about the regulatory uh, constraint uh, facing the merchant when they want to uh, join this e-commerce, whether they have uh, faced this uh, regulatory barrier and uh, whether they need kind of a facilitation from the government. Uh, yeah, you, uh, we, we know that there are some new regulation about e-commerce business whether these merchants are actually experiencing problem or uh, issue with regard to the new e-commerce regulation. 
think that's all the question. Uh, thank you, Monica. Thanks, uh, Mas Wage. Monica, if you don't mind, before I go to Sherry, I would like to read the question from Lydia because okay. it's really related to Wage's first question. Okay. So Lydia Napitupulu from UI mm -hmm. asks, Considering digital skills training as important for digital merchants, respondents did not seem to find Kartu Prakerja as one of the most government assistance, most important government assistance. Mm -hmm. Could you explain this? Is it because Kartu Prakerja is not one of the choices given when respondents are asked to evaluate importance of government assistance? And number two, did the survey ask whether respondents are getting some digital skill training? And if yes, where from? So that's from Lydia. Okay, you wanna answer these questions first before we invite Sherry? Okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, when, when we... Uh, uh, when we designed the questionnaire, uh, we collaborated with, with Shopee and uh, this is, you know, one of their, uh, uh, one, uh, one, one, one option uh, uh, for, for the question uh, on the top support programs. They, they put digital skills, training and knowledge. So I'm pretty sure they, they could answer better than me uh, when we put this question, the question in terms of what exactly they mean by digital skills, training and knowledge. But um from my experience, I mean, you know, talking to uh, some of my colleagues in the digital platforms who uh, have been like enrolling programs to onboard like more enterprises into the platform. I think it's a lot to do uh, with, uh, you know, uh, digital literacy as well. Like maybe there are some levels of digital skills right i mean the 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 most basic one is digital literacy basically uh you know even as simple as you know get, getting your uh, identity card ready and being able to you know put the number uh of your identity card recognize the number in your identity card and you know uh to register online so as simple as that, I mean, I, I've heard from, I heard from, uh, you know, my colleague, for example, many of them, you know, have problems finding their identity card. They don't know where the identity card is, so they cannot register. So as simple as that. But I can imagine also their, you know, uh, higher level digital skills, like, you know, for example, creating content uh, on the website, right? Um, so, uh, uh, and also, I think, uh, I don't know if it's related to sales and marketing, but uh, uh, being able to, this, this relates to the other top support program, but I can imagine that in, in the head of the, uh, uh, the merchants is that uh, digital knowledge could also mean how to market your, your products uh, online because it's so different marketing products online. Uh, with marketing products offline. So, you know, it, it could relate to the second uh, support programs in terms of digital uh, marketing, uh, sorry, uh, sales and marketing. And uh, to, to uh, answer uh, Lydia's question, uh, yeah, as you see in the slide here, the when we ask uh, the merchants in terms of government assistance that they would like to have, we only have cash transfers and that cash transfers includes pre-employment card. So we don't break down cash transfers. So it's only cash transfers, or, uh, tax incentive or debt restructuring program and pre-employment card is there. Uh, and yeah, we unfortunately we, we did not ask questions uh, whether or not they, they have had uh, digital trainings and if they have were they had their digital training from. But I believe like some digital platforms, including Shopee, uh, gave trainings to their merchants as well. Right. So uh, on Wage, on the second questions, uh, e uh, the ecosystem of e-commerce in Indonesia and regulatory constraint barriers, uh, uh, can you be more specific? Like, yeah, in terms of uh, what, what regulations are you thinking of? In, in, in this but we we uh, we 
the 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 World Bank conducted um, a national representative digital economy household survey uh, before the pandemic um, in March, and uh, we had questions uh, asking, you know, why merchants join social media but not platform, and uh, yeah, one of the uh, one of the options is uh, regulatory barriers, and I think there's quite a num there's quite a uh, like a, a, a significant share of merchants who say that uh, yeah regulatory uh, barriers uh, was like the was one of the main constraints to join platforms instead of you know just social media, but uh, but not tax. So other regulatory barriers, but but not but not tax. So uh, yeah, tax is not uh, their main concerns of joining platform. Okay, Awake, uh, do yes. you want to clarify? Yes. Your... Yeah. I think uh, if we follow the government regulation and uh, also the follow up minister of trade regulation on e commerce, uh, there is a requirement that all merchants or the players has to. Uh, get the kind of a business license and also uh, what is the tax file number. And we know that a lot of uh, merchants are in the informal sector and some of them are actually not, uh, do not have tax file number. And uh, because of this, maybe there's also uh, resistance from them to, to, to register and also to, to give their information and data. So I'm not sure whether it is covered like uh, during the survey about this kind of issue about business uh, operation license, uh, business permit for merchants. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Wage. Uh, Monica, you want to hold on that uh, while we are inviting Sherry? Uh, so I mean, just quickly, uh, okay. yeah, just entering uh, Wage's question. Uh, uh, yeah, we don't have we don't have uh, that specific details uh, in terms of uh, whether that specific you know regulation uh, is impeding merchants to on board. Uh, but uh, I think that could be part of the digital skills training and knowledge. Okay, now let me go to Sherry. Sherry, thank you. thanks for your patience. So oh, okay. over to you. Great, thank you so much, Pak Acho, and uh, um, selamat siang, teman-teman. Wow, the, if there's uh, one small thing I can be thankful to this COVID is I can attend ISG talk. <laughs> 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 of course, at a great expense. Um, yeah, but but this is so wonderful. Formerly, I thought I couldn't get through the link, but now I, I realize I can just put in the conference ID and the postcode, uh, the passcode. You need digital here. training, Sherry. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think well, so. But this is the only thing. Well, you don't know how much it takes <laughs> to get around. I, I cannot use Zoom as to initiate a conference. It's banned over here. So, oh. yeah. So, uh. yeah, the bit.ly thing doesn't work here. So, it was just by um, coincidence or maybe just a just good a nice destination i think <laughs> thank you monica for for getting this through for me and uh, uh and i want to say that this talk is so wonderful for 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 quite a number of reasons and one one thing i'm particularly excited about is that we are doing something in Pelero with, without without having coordinated so i, I think uh, there's just something we we share um, both in terms of uh, research interest and uh, aspiration. So over here in China, we have been doing a, a quarterly online survey looking at micro and small enterprises since mm. the third quarter of last year. And I, I, can, uh, I can see very clear um, parallels in terms of findings as well. In our survey, uh, so, so the sample size is roughly the same and we work with uh, Ant Group, so um, mm. Alibaba, Alipay yep. basically. Um, and uh, uh, we see the, the respondents identify weak demand and a lack of mm. access to loans, yeah, credit mm. as 
the most important uh, sort of uh, barriers or issues or challenges or whatever way you want to name them. But but these things are common. Uh, but there's a something uh, quite um, there's a something different as well, uh, which is a great feature in the Chinese surveys finding, which is about uh, cost. So the mm. um, micro business people, um, they um, they think of cost uh, escalation. Yeah, costs have been rising. Mm. That troubles them. That put their sort of uh, uh, their um, the lifespan of their business. Um, is greatly shortened, and uh, their outlook for the for as to how long they can survive this, or whether things are picking up, um, this will, uh, so cost uh, issue, cost uh, rise, rising cost mm. is identified as a main issue. So I wonder if Monica, you see something similar as well. Uh, but of course, uh, that really just in terms of uh, findings, uh, and I have a number of questions. There, there, there's a lot that can be talked about, but I want to mention just a few things. Um, one is uh, one is about the the sample or the, the, the merchants we are looking at. Uh, in your sample, it's very pronounced that these are young, uh, reasonably well-educated people who can quickly pick up this uh, um, digital kind of uh, opportunities. Yeah, so they mm. switch to to, to online um, sales, yeah, they can mm -hmm. do, they can start a business, which probably to some extent um, reduces uh, the uh, barrier of uh, getting, uh, of uh, starting a business as, as opposed to offline. But mm. uh, I think it is it's probably still a case that this is uh, something I would like to confirm with you that um, the, the people they are selling their products uh, too, yeah. So, so here there's uh, many goods and rather, as opposed to services. Yeah? So, so they sell they sell products, uh, commodities, and to a reasonably uh, small uh, uh, circle, which are very much localized. Is mm. that the case? Yeah. So we are not talking about someone in Jakarta sending things. Uh, uh, you know. 500 kilometers away or even uh, 15 kilo, uh, 1500 kilometers away. They're not doing a trans regional kind of uh, uh, sales, yeah? So they are serving the local residents for uh, small value items, basically. And, and that's what we see for this uh, uh, micro uh, enterprise prices do they they make use of uh, online services uh, these online platforms where they can uh, advertise that they can let people know they are selling their things and they then they provide um, uh, their services to the to the local residents basically it's a residence based thing uh, it's a directly to see and uh, um, and 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 it's all sort of uh, small value items and and secondly um, do you think that these merchants are using these online e-commerce uh, uh, jobs uh, as their main source of income, or do they actually take advantage of the flexibility these platforms can provide them with and uh, use them as something on the side? Um, my speculation is um, if these are very young business people, uh, partly because of COVID, partly because youth unemployment anyway. So this may, may be one of their main source of income. But then the implication is, uh, is this enough? And also, would there be a major shift uh, once the COVID, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, is going away in the near future? Yeah. So there will be a great implication uh, for that. And, uh, um, and the third aspect uh, is related to um, to the to the lack of credit, yeah, um, or a loan or capital. I, I think you use the word capital, and that's a that's a common challenge we found. Um, I, I guess it's not even restricted to online business. It's uh, for for small or micro or even medium sized businesses. This is a commonly um, uh, phenomenon is a common phenomenon. I think they, they all face this. But what can um, online business, um, in the sense, enjoy? Yeah, a, a lot of 
uh, over uh, over in China, you have this big platforms that, that provides you not just a, a market, an online marketplace, but uh, the digital finance, the underpinning digital finance support is very much part of the um, e-commerce uh, phenomenon, if you like. So not just a payment uh, per se uh, is it, a is an uh, is a necessary and also enabling um, aspect of uh, e-commerce uh, development, um, credit, uh, um, finance services, uh, insurance, um, credit rating, yeah, loan provision, or even investment. So, so there's a full range of uh, financial products and uh, financial mm. uh, services that can be provided through online platforms like this. So you, you don't just have a marketplace, you have a whole range of digital financial products mm-hmm. that are linked to this because you do have mm-hmm. access to the reliable information of both buyers and sellers and you can monitor the transactions and you know how much they sell, how good they are and uh, uh, whether they have been delivering their services or whether as a consumer you have been paying. So you basically have a complete um, data, uh, if you like, uh, to observe these people and, and, and produce a very clear uh, portrait and profile of these users, be it the sellers and buyers or sometimes simultaneously. Yeah? And then that gives you the, the um, advantage of um, reducing the cost of uh, evaluating this uh, um, ordinary people who would otherwise have a very little um, credit information, background information to show you they are worthy of, uh, um, uh, of some loan or lending from you. And also it also um, reduces the need uh, or, in, or in most cases it waives the need of uh, providing collateral. So this is the, the, if you like, the beauty of a digital uh, finance to some extent. Of course, it comes with a mm-hmm. whole sort of uh, issues and, and, and other problems with it. But when mm-hmm. it can play a very positive role, it's the data that um, capturing the behavior and the, the transaction his, uh, history of these buyers and sellers uh, that provides both the buyers um, uh, with a credit to shop and the sellers, the credit to, to buy stock or to, uh, to, to uh, support the whole supply process. Yeah. So, so I wonder if there's a thinking or, or understanding in that area. And, and of course, this is not um, happening in, a, in, a nat- in naturally in the sense that it requires a whole set of uh, uh, infrastructure uh, which mm-hmm. have to support, yeah. Just as uh, just then we talk about internet access. In fact, uh, over here in China, the the takeoff really happened when the um, uh, smartphone, yeah, becomes uh, such a uh, affordable item. So most people shop with their mobile phones, yeah. Uh, they don't use uh, the the uh, maybe ten years ago people do online shopping on their laptops, but but now everybody shop on the phone. Yeah, so smartphone, internet access, and uh, and um, a reliable and affordable logistic system, which uh, is- Sorry, a- sorry, uh, can yeah. you wrap up? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. So so I thought uh, maybe um, I could invite uh, Monica to share a bit more thoughts on this. And uh, if there's an opportunity, we, we will discuss more and, and even do nice. some comparative. Yeah, study. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much, Sherry. Uh, Monica, I know that's a lot, but uh, because our time is thinning, can I invite Pat Terry to also uh, share uh, his view? Uh, Terry, are you there? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, Val and I have been talking about the health component of the uh, <clears throat> digital um, uh, merchants, and we were wondering whether you have a breakdown of the sort of health products that you've been looking at. Uh, Our expectation would be that JAMU, patent medicines, and other Mm -hmm. things directed at COVID would be part of the the, uh, um, the merchant's uh, offerings, and that some of these could be fake 
treatments. Uh, and do you, do you have a sense of whether that is a problem with this kind of activity? Good question, Patery, thank you. Monica, over to you before I read some question uh, from the Q&A. Sure. So uh, uh, for Sherry, thank you for uh, informing us about uh, your uh, quarterly online survey. Please share with, with us, if not like with me, I'll be like very interested to, uh, to read the, the findings of, of these surveys. Um, uh, in terms of cost escalation, we did not ask uh, about uh, uh, their cost uh, in this survey, but we did ask uh, cost in our, our last survey in Bukalapak. And let me, when I, uh, yeah. So let me read some of the findings. And this was back in May or June uh, 2020, right? Um, so it, uh, so from the finding from the survey, it says that uh, more severe, uh, there are more severe increases in input cost than labor cost. Uh, merchants were, were mostly impacted via input and other costs, less via labor costs. 45% of merchants surveyed experienced an increase in input cost. 64% uh, uh, of merchants experienced no change in labor cost. 45% experienced an increase in other costs. 52% uh, experience an increase in total cost. So that's, uh, yeah, so that's the finding from the, uh, from, from the previous uh, survey. In terms of profile, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I don't have, you know, the, the numbers. Uh, I think Shopee will, will know better, but I don't think many of them uh, uh, export to uh, other countries or like sell to other countries. But I have to say that they, uh, the transactions uh, are happening like across Indonesia. You know, I've, uh, I've bought like some, uh, some products from like, uh, from Aceh, uh, you know, uh, far away from, from Jakarta. So I think, you know, uh, these products are being transacted like, uh, you know, across uh, Indonesia. Uh, whether or not that it's, main income or secondary income. Uh, what we found in the labor force survey is that out of internet using workers, the incidence of uh, engaging in e-commerce as secondary income is higher than, it, than as main income. Uh, but I don't remember the, the, the exact breakdown in terms of uh, uh, how many uh, use e-commerce as, as main income versus uh, a secondary income, but the incidence is higher as secondary income or internet using workers. Uh, and yeah, you are absolutely right about uh, taking advantage of, of platforms, uh, you know, for greater access to digital finance and, um, and, and uh, lower uh, transaction, uh, lower transaction costs because, uh, uh, data uh, is uh, is collected um i i think uh i think in china it's much more uh, advanced in terms of uh platform offering you know greater digital finance services compared to indonesia i know that shopee has already started offering loans but you know it's it's uh, i think it's still like very much uh, new in indonesia in terms of uh, platform offering loans to their uh, merchants i know that uh, we have discussion internally you know uh, uh, to basically uh, engaging collaboration with digital platform about this like you know how merchants can access uh, loans you know uh, merchants in platform can access loans not only uh, you know, selling their products, but I think it's uh, uh, it, it's still at the uh, initial uh, phase, uh, Sherry. Uh, but also, I also would like to uh, yeah mention maybe you already uh, have this in your mind as well uh, that more data can be both like advantage and disadvantage to uh, the merchants because uh, then you. Uh, then like, I mean, greater transparency in terms of like how much you're selling, uh, what kind of, you know, the, the, the previews that you get from buyers, uh, it could 
uh, you know, disadvantage uh, merchants who only sell like slightly lower quality products, right? Because then uh, people uh, will will always choose like those with like better previews um, or like you know more stars or whatever. So uh, that could be like a polar polarization in terms of uh, you know uh, winners take all. Like uh, one or two merchants will like capture like a big share of, of the market while the rest uh, uh, are left with lower or uh, even no sales. Um, uh, uh, for Pat Terry, um, yeah, uh, vitamin and yeah, vitamin goes under the health products. I mean, we don't ask like, uh, 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 we don't ask like, in more detail like uh you know what, what kind of health health products they they uh they sell but then uh yeah vitamins definitely go into uh, the, the health components uh and whether uh this sort of like you know uh casual selling of like uh medic uh health health products could be uh could be uh could be bad uh i i really don't know the answer but like uh i i know that you know uh you know we have to be careful in terms of buying some you know some some product even like covid 19 you know chinese products right i mean there are a lot of like fake ones <laughs> but i guess it it again goes back to the the knowledge uh of the buyers i think that's that's the more important one i mean we cannot restrict uh what products like sellers sell uh, except like if if they're proven to be you know illegal products right but otherwise i think more knowledge to the buyer side i think uh is critical thank you thank you monica now let me read uh three questions from q a box sure tio ardiono from nu asks about financial inclusion uh, did the new merchants already have access to payment and banking services before switching to e-commerce. That's one. Second one is uh, Krishna Gupta, also from ANU. He asks about taxation. Can you say something about the industry's tax potential? Do you know if your respondents have NPWP, that's tax file number, or income below PTKP, or income below taxable threshold. That's number two. Number three is Kit Wiryawan. He asks about the geographic distribution of ban press program. Is it evenly distributed at the national level? So those are the three questions that I'd like you to uh, respond, Monica. Okay, sure. In terms of financial inclusion, uh... I, again, like, uh, I don't have the answers uh, uh, to, uh, to the questions whether merchants have, pay, have like bank accounts before they join e-commerce. Mm -hmm. I mean, but definitely when they join the e-commerce, they have to have bank account, right? Um, or maybe some platforms, you know, accept cash. Uh, but I, I never, uh, I, I never... I know at least like based on my personal like, experience, I never see like merchants uh, without offering, you know, uh, bank payment, right? I mean, um, but it could be that, uh, you know, some of these platform have, have, have been reaching out to offline enterprises, right? Uh, to onboard to the platform. So this could be like enterprises who uh, prior to the platforms reaching out to them uh, might not have, um, might not have a uh, uh, bank account before and then you know uh, they were supported by the platforms to open the bank accounts and then they were able to onboard so that's that's a possibility um, but there's also like uh, Bukalapak has a quite a unique uh, online to offline uh, program right so there's, there's a lot of them uh, who were like uh, traditional merchants, traditional mom and pop stores who were able to, uh, yeah, to uh, to to offer um, 
uh, service uh, to to offer like yeah uh, uh, e-commerce services to offline customers. So um, yeah, but uh, yeah, this this online to offline also have a digital payment. So yeah, I mean I don't have a, a perfect or a good answers to that, but uh, it 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 I do believe that uh, if we if we can increase financial inclusion, if we can have uh more indonesians to be financially to, to have like bank accounts uh, especially you know uh, mobile bank accounts then i can imagine that it will help uh, e-commerce utilization i i can imagine that more indonesians will on board on e-commerce um uh, uh regarding taxation i believe that uh, the vat tax on uh uh, on on products sold at uh, uh, e-commerce has already issued, right? So uh, yeah, there should be a VAT uh, tax already on on products being sold on on platform. But I know that the government is currently working very hard, um, you know, to to basically uh, revisit, you know, some of these like regulations to ensure like a fair level playing field between online and offline. Um. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't believe that uh, NPWP is a requirement to be like merchants on on platform. Um. Yeah. And and as you see, uh, already like in the beginning, sixty eight point two percent were micro enterprises with a threshold like less than three hundred million uh, rupiah. Uh, per year their revenues so uh, i can imagine that a lot of them were below the income tax threshold um in terms of geographic distributions of ban press I, I don't have that number um yeah i i don't know but maybe uh, some of the other world bank surveys uh might have it i mean we uh, I, I can you know look at uh in uh into the data of this digital merchant survey but i don't have it right now Thanks, uh, Monica. Is there any other question? I don't see any hand. There's one written question, but I think this is similar to the previous question about the geographical distribution. This is from Laboratorium, Laboratorium Terpadu mm. Universitas. Oh, I cannot see. Um, they were wondering whether you collected geographical data if so, is there a geographical concentration and are there any differences between sellers in Java and non-Java? Um, yeah, I mean, we can we can break it down from our yeah. data because we asked uh, their provincial location, but uh, yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't have it right here. Oh, sorry, that was Laboratorium Terpadu Universitas Syakwala. Thanks, uh, colleagues from Syakwala. And there, uh, I don't see any hands raised. And actually, our time is up. One more minute, but no more questions. So uh, let me thank you again, uh, Monica, for presenting again in this series. I hope you can present again with all those upcoming reports. And yeah. I thank uh, all the attendants, all the participants. Um, especially those who uh, attend this from far away. And please stay tuned. We will have other uh, series uh, in the next weeks.